Hello. Okay. Okay, for those, uh, is anybody who is not familiar with Moodle? You want me to show you where to get information about this course? All of you have used it before, right? Okay. I, I can monitor who is logging in and who is doing what. <laughs> and I saw only four people showing any activity on the model in this course. So maybe just too early, it's all right. <laughs> the most important time would be when I put the first assignment. Then I will send you an email and uh, you will know where to pick up the assignment from. But what you will see is week by week, uh, the lecture that I lecture notes that I post before the lecture so that you can download and print it if you like. Or if you have your laptop, you can bring it. And uh, and then a recorded lecture that you will see here, for example, audio video recording of the lecture after the class. For those uh, who want to listen to it again, I don't want to be a substitute for actually being present in the class. And uh, that's not healthy because you miss out on that ability to ask questions. And I, I do want, I think it is an important part of learning in the class. So I try to encourage you as much as possible to have a discussion. It's not a, a one-way transfer of information. It has to be uh, placed at a level that you can absorb, so you must control it. Otherwise, I'll just keep on. Particularly when I have a prepared notes like that, it's very easy for me to go through 13 sheets or 13 uh, pages of notes in one day. But you need to control the speed. If I'm going fast, you need to tell me. As we slow down, uh, and there are forums and there are other things in there that you can use to express your views and stuff like that. Now, in the last uh, lecture, we looked at, uh, in a very general way, what is process control? What are we going to learn in this course? What are the tools that we need to know beforehand, and ones that we are going to develop in this course? Okay, basically, the definition of a process control is the act of manipulating some input variable in a process to meet a desired specified objective in the presence of external disturbances. These are all key elements of it. The ability to send and control some input so that you get a desired output in the end in the presence of disturbances, like we are doing now. I'm shouting in the presence of disturbance, not coming from above. We need to live with that. Right? Um, the elements of a feedback control we saw are the sensors, which measure a particular state of the system. It could be temperature, pressure, flow rate, concentration, what have you. And uh, set a desired goal, that is a set point. And the difference between the set point and what is measured gives you an error. How far are we away in the actual process from the measurement? And so we develop a control scheme. So we talked about the proportional integral and derivative control in a very quantitative way. We are going to make all these quantitative in the next uh, several lectures. Okay. And the final control element is an integral part of that loop, which is the one that actually implements the control. So we sense it. We know what we want it to be. We know the error. We need to take a control action. Control algorithm tells us what it is. And then the action is actually implemented, typically in the form of a mal or uh, a heating element, uh, changing the heating rates, etc. Why do we need control system? We talked about it. Safety of the operation is a major concern. Quality of the product to narrow down the variation in the product quality. Uh, environmental considerations. We may have a environmental legislation that we need to meet. So we, want to, we want to make sure that the effluent that is coming out from a plant meets those guidelines. So you put a control uh, to meet those. And a smooth and stable operation. A stable operation, what does it mean? Stability is an important concept that we are going to use quite a lot in this course because the control system we want to use or develop should remain stable. What does, this is a new term I'm using now. I didn't use it in the last lecture. What does that mean, stability? Have you come across this in differential equation course or anywhere else? Concept of a stability, concept of a stable, stable system would be one that remains steady or bounded. It doesn't blow up. Okay? Uh, a simple example would be if I had a pencil and I want to do this trick of balancing this, I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not good at it. But the whole thing is here. And so see you that I can't do. What is the problem there? The problem is it a stable system? If I leave it like this, is it a stable system? The answer is if I can balance it perfectly, it stays there. Okay? 
But if I vibrate this a little bit, it falls, right? So this is an unstable system because slightest perturbation will cause it to tip. So if that is the case, I can think control action will be to move the bottom in such a way a juggler can do, that he can maintain it in a vertical position. Okay? So there is sensing a feedback control to move the hand, keep it in a stable situation. A lot of modern aircraft, for example, particularly the fighter planes, the smaller ones, are very unstable. If they have a turbulence disturbance, they can be toppled very easily. So control action of monitoring the plane position and controlling is very important. Okay? Uh, in the chemical plant context, it will be basically reactors that go out of control. And you have uh, an exothermic reaction that uh, produces more heat and reacts faster, and it just blows up. Chemical plants are the most co uh, common cause of fire and accident. Okay? So instability in that sense, uh, we need to monitor processes and keep it under control, under uh, stable conditions. So smooth and stable operation of the plant is one of the objectives that we would want to achieve in a control system. Uh, control system is not a way to overcome poor design. It should be built on a good design. You cannot try to meet a design objective with a controller. Uh, and again, I'm emphasizing that safety is an important consideration. And we saw what an automatic process control is simply when you automate the whole process with, with at least a manual intervention. Now, what do we need to achieve this? Of course, we need a knowledge of the chemical process itself. That is the thing that we have learned in fluid mechanics, heat transfer, mass transfer, reaction engineering courses. So how to build models, how to do, you might have done how to do steady state design. We are going to extend that to dynamical systems, uh, analyzing that. And so we need what you have learned in differential equations to be able to solve these dynamical equations, which are ordinary differential equations. So we'll use Laplace transform to go from the differential equation domain to algebraic equation domain. And we will review Laplace transform very quickly. And then we need, particularly if you're going for automatic process control, we need interface with the computer. So we are going to use computers to generate the control schemes and to implement uh, them as well. So MATLAB has a uh, very good control system toolboxes that we will use. Now, there are a few other points that I want to talk before we start developing specific models. I'm going to introduce the idea of what is optimization and what is a dynamic model. Uh, what is a model for an optimization system and what is a model for a uh, dynamic system? Have you done optimization in any other course? You have taken an economics course, I guess. So this part may be fairly uh, straightforward to you, but just as an example, to answer the question, uh, how do we Select the set point. In a particular plant, how do we choose a set point? We would like to choose a set point in such a way that it optimizes something about the uh, process. Ideally, you would like to maximize your profit. Okay? Um, there could be other criteria that one can put up. So this example illustrates what could be an objective function. As a process engineer, it's your task to come up with an objective that you want to maximize or minimize. If it is a pollutant discharge, you want to construct an objective function that you want to minimize. If it is profit or a cost function, profit function, you want to maximize them. A cost function, you would want to minimize that. That such a function comes from your understanding of the process. So you are going to be writing it down. And then it will depend on a number of process constraints. And that is also illustrated in this particular example. What is this example? Here you have several cities along a river. And uh, each city, of course, has a wastewater treatment plant. So WWTP is a wastewater treatment plant. So city one produces a uh, certain amount of uh, waste, environmental waste, P1. Okay, so so many milligrams of a particular pollutant um, uh, per day, per hour, or whatever. Okay? So the units and things are given in the next slide. I'm just trying to illustrate what the problem is. Describe it in words, and then you'll have to write that in a mathematical form. Now, the wastewater treatment plant removes some of, some of these pollutants, and it's not able to remove all of it, so it discharges W1 milligrams uh, per day. Okay? And that goes into the river at nodal point 1. So you have a clean water coming from the river, city 1 discharges a certain number of pollutants. Now, the river itself has the ability to uh, remove these pollutants by natural processes, by biological processes. Okay? So the flow rate is Q13, and I'm going to define 
R13 as a rate of removal by natural process. So the wastewater treatment plant removes it forcefully in a plant, and then as the water goes from one city to the next city, the river is going to be able to uh, reduce the pollution to some extent. And then at point three, you have uh, another city, which is on a side stream to the river. Okay, so from so it is discharging material W2 to point two, but this is carried by another side stream to the main river. The main river is flowing this way. Okay, and there are two other cities, city three and city four, that draw water from there and then discharge it back into the river. Each one with its own uh, waste treatment plant. Okay, so our objective is to minimize the cost of the water uh, treatment plants in a combined setup, okay, for all the four cities. We want to minimize the cost. But there are constraints. The constraints would be the concentration in the river or at the point where you discharge cannot be more than a certain amount. In this case, say 20 milligrams per day. Okay. So you have to meet that constraint. Any questions on the problem? Do you understand the problem description? There are basically four cities discharging each one with a water treatment plant, so they take in a certain amount and they discharge at a different level, lower level. Okay? And they all have to meet at least 20 grams per day uh, below that. It cannot be above that. And the river itself has certain ability to uh, reduce the pollutant in going from one nodal one to nodal two or nodal two to nodal three, three to four, etc. So let me just summarize all the symbols that I have introduced in the next slide, okay. WWTP is a waste uh, treatment plant, and then PI is a waste generated by city I. I could be one, two, three, or four. There are four cities in this case. Okay. And it is given in terms of milligrams per day. So that is a waste generated, and WI is a waste discharged by the city. So it is reducing the amount from PI to WI. Okay. So the fraction of the waste removed by each one of the plants is described by Xi. So what would Xi be? If you have to describe in terms of W and Pi. Pi is the amount that is generated that is entering the wastewater treatment plant. Wi is the amount that is released divided by Pi the amount that is entering. So it is a fraction of the material that is removed uh, by each one of those uh, process plants. So you'll have X1, X2, X3, X4. Okay? And CI is the concentration of the pollutant at junction I. Now I need to explain this a bit more carefully because why do we need to worry about it? Because environmental regulation dictates a number for this. Okay? So that CI should be uh, greater than, I think there's a number somewhere, 20 milligram per day. That's a constraint. So what you need to be able to do, given a description of this problem, first if you read a set of equations like this, you should understand how they come from, where they come from. And the next page would be given a description alone, you should be able to write down these equations. These are nothing but conservation laws and definitions of fraction converted. Okay? So and a uh, definition of a concentration. So C I is a concentration. And you are told that all these concentrations must be less than or equal to 20 milligrams per day. None of the concentration can be greater than that. And these are concentrations at the exit of each node. Okay. So after they mix, for example, in uh, here, C1 would be the concentration here. Okay. So this is pure pure clean water. There is no pollutant there. So the concentration C1 is determined by what comes basically from this stream. Okay? And similarly, C3 would be the concentration that is leaving that particular node. And of course, as it goes along, this concentration is going to change. Why? Because the natural process is also degrading the pollutant. Okay? So these concentrations are defined as a concentration right at the point where two streams mix and the exit stream from that. Okay? So these are C1, C2. This would be C3. That would be C2, and this would be C4. Okay? Please, if there are any questions, do ask me, okay? Okay, so far. <coughs> and Q 
QIJ is a volumetric flow rate between node 1 and node 2, and vol volumetric flow rate is going to be constant in each segment of the pipe. I'm sorry, I need to keep going, going back and forth. So Q and 3 will be the flow rate in this pipe between node 1 and node 3. Similarly, Q2, 3, Q3, 4, etc. Similarly, R13, R23, etc. are going to be defined as the fraction of pollutant that is removed, fraction of the pollutant that is removed in that segment of the river, okay, uh, in going from junction I to junction J. And DI is the cost of the waste treatment plant. How much does it cost dollars per milligram of the pollutant that you remove? Okay. So you're given all these, so you need to formulate an optimization problem that will satisfy all the math balance constraints at the nodal points, plus give you an objective function that you can minimize them. And that will give you the set of operating conditions. Okay? So that's going to do the, give you the set point for any controller that you design on the plant uh, subsequently. So here, does the first equation make sense? What are we doing here? The total daily cost of waste treatment Z for all the four plants, Z is that cost. It's in dollars. And then saying that it's given by B1, P1, X1 plus D2, P2, X2 plus D3, P3, X3. Does that make sense to you? Okay. D1 is, if you take any one of them, this is the dollar per milligram. Okay. What is P4X4? Is the amount, the material amount of milligrams per day. Okay. So this, the units of this should come out to be milligrams of the pollutant per day. Because X4 is the conversion and P4 is the amount that is uh, entering. So if P4 is entering, X4 is converted, what is left behind uh, is what is going to uh, enter in the next state. Okay? So that is the co cost of removing in each plant, the cost of removing uh, the pollutant is DI, uh, XI, PI. So you can write this as summation of di, di, xi. So we have understood the process description. We have understood this. We have introduced a set of symbols to describe the various variables. Now we are writing the mathematical formulation of the problem. So that is the cost. Now the, the conservation equations, mass balance equations, conversion equations are all given by these set of five equations. Okay? We saw already, for example, for this one, we said xi is the fractional recovery. So it's going to be um, what was that? WI? PI minus WI divided by PI. That is a fraction of uh, material that is uh, removed. Okay? So you can then write this as equal to PXI, PIXI equals PI minus WI. And so uh, Take this to the other side, so write it as Wi is equal to Pi times 1 minus Xi. Okay? I'm just switching this. Take this to the side, take that to the other side. So you get Wi equals Pi times 1 minus Xi. Okay? For each one of the processes. Now, let me just illustrate one more, and then I will ask you to figure out, make sure that you understand how the others are uh, written. C Ci, concentration C1. Okay, how, how is the concentration defined? What are the units for concentration? So many milligrams per milliliter, it could be. So many milligrams per liter, it could be. Okay, so that's what we need to get. We need to get the amount of pollutants per unit volume of the liquid. Okay, so what does uh, 1 minus xi times pi tell you, or 1 minus x1 times p1? That is the same as w1. W1, or, uh, W1, what is the unit for that? The unit for W1 would be so many milligrams per day. Okay? That is the amount of material that is discharged from plant 1. Divided by the flow rate. The flow rate would be the flow rate in Q13, this flow rate. So we're attacking the con uh, calculating the concentration at this point. So that concentration is what comes from here. Nothing comes from there. So what comes from here divided by the flow rate. 
The fuel load is in milliliters per or liters per day. The flow rate is given in liters per day. Okay. Am I going fast back and forth or is following? Okay. I just want to find the right place. Okay. So that gives you Q13 in terms of units of liters per day. Okay. So the day and day will cancel out. You get milligrams per liter. So many milligrams of the pollutant per liter is the concentration. You need to do the same thing to derive C2, C3, and C4, but making sure that when you're doing C3, you're mixing all the streams that are coming at nodal point 3. Okay? Then you will get the following equation. Just uh, verify. Okay? So, uh, uh, constraint problem now, this is called a constraint minimization problem. Why? Because we want to minimize this, but we want to minimize this subject to satisfying these equations with a constraint of none of the C's should exceed 20 milligrams per day. Okay? So, an obvious minimization, of course, is zero dollars, right? You don't want to spend any money, okay? So, how can I get zero dollars from this? I don't worry about any conversion. I take out all the flats, then X1, X2, X3 are all zero, okay? So, I will get the cost as zero. Now, if I take both X1, X2, X3 as zero and try to solve for these, for a given set of uh, waste that each city generates. So what I need to do is I need to specify what is one of these numbers, how much is produced, how much is naturally converted, because artificially nothing is converted. I've taken the plant out, for example. Then I can still calculate what will be uh, the concentration of the various streams without any action, without any control action, without any plant. Okay? So I'm not putting a plant and simply discharging everything. That is the minimum cost solution, if you like. Zero cost, and but I'm violating all the environmental regulations here. Okay? So I need to put a plant. Now I'm going to say, okay, I want to find that set of concentrations that meet the regulations but minimizes my cost. Now, how do we do that? You might have seen in the other course, and uh, if there is time, we will see towards the end of this course, using MATLAB. MATLAB has the ability to take all the equations that they have written and do a minimization. What, how did you do the minimization in the other course? What kind of tool did you use? Excel? MATCAD, Excel, okay. Uh, MATLAB has some very nice, uh, very robust minimization uh, uh, tools available. I'm not very familiar with Excel tools, so I shouldn't really comment on that. But no treatment means zero cost, means no conversion, and then this will be the concentration. The final solution using MATLAB that we have obtained, and uh, we are not really focusing on it now, is uh, X1 should be 0.8. That is, 80% should be removed in the first plant, 50% should be removed in the second plant, 56% in the third plant, and fourth plant you don't need, for example. Then it will cost you $12,000 per day, and the concentration in C1, C2, C3 will be 20, but C4 will be 15. So you meet all of the requirements. Okay. So this is how you would ideally formulate determining the set point. Write down. You can do this in any given process. You can do this in HISIS or ASPA. Okay. Have the process flow sheet. Have all the inputs, and you're just solving for the steady state solution, and then you. Would you can optimize it. Couple the uh, hexes to an optimizer, and you can say, because, why can you use the optimization? There are reasons that, as a design engineer, you have a lot of degrees of freedom. Have you seen what a degree of freedom is? Degree of freedom analysis? You have seen that. Basically, when you write down the number of equations, we have, like in this particular case, we wrote down five equations, but there are more than five symbols there. So the difference between the number of variables and number of constraints, number of equations, is your degree of freedom. And those degrees of freedom are the ones that you are specifying here. Okay, so you need to specify that. Then you'll be left with five unknowns that you can solve for from five equations. So the degree of freedom is the difference between number of, number of variables, which is always larger, and the number of equations, which is smaller. And the difference is your degree of freedom. So as a design engineer, you have these degrees of freedom. So you can say, I, I want to change these degrees of freedom so that I have an objective function that I want to maximize or minimize. And that is the steady state design in an optimal sense 
to get your set points for the controller. Any questions? I've been talking and you're all very quiet. Yeah, please. Oh, for this particular one? Yeah. Uh, I don't have those numbers. There is a program that we just entered one of my graduate students in some time back. Okay. So generated these examples. Uh, but we will come and revisit a problem like this. And uh, we will, when I give you an assignment problem or a homework problem, um, I need to give you all these numbers. Only then you'll be able to solve. But right now I'm just laying out the conceptually what, what are the things that you need to specify. So your question is, for getting these numbers, what are the P? I don't have those numbers uh, on hand. Okay, so that gives us an idea about uh, how you would generate uh, optimal set points. Okay, um, so the set points are operating under steady state condition. We never talked about any dynamical thing in that environmental problem. Okay, so the plant is generating at a steady rate every day a certain amount of pollutant. It is moving it, and so none of the concentrations, none of the flow rates change with time. But there are a few scenarios where we need to worry about dynamics. Dynamics meaning changes with time. Okay. So the first example that is described here is suppose I have I'm driving a car and I slam on the brake. Is the car going to come to an immediate stop at that instant? No. Why? There is a inertia for the car. Okay. It's already moving with a certain velocity. That's a certain mass. If you write down, for example, m times b v d t is equal to some of the external forces, what you're doing is in braking, you are applying an opposing force, the direction of the motion that is opposing that. But that even if you can apply it instantaneously, <coughs> it's not going to bring down the velocity to zero because it has certain inertia, it has certain mass. So the velocity is going to decrease gradually over a period of time. The time over which it decreases is what we call the dynamic period for which the system is responding two stimulus that we put in. Okay. Uh, another example is uh, government trying to fix the economy. Okay. So a financial stimulus package. You can do one of two things. You can uh, cut down the taxes or you can increase the spending. Tax more and spend more. Both of them will revive the economy and there is a dynamic associated with it. Now in the case of a car, this is a physical system. So we can actually write down a model like this on the car. Okay. And you can predict how long it will take for the car to come to a stop. But in the case of a model in the financial system where a whole society is involved, it's very difficult to do any modeling, even though financial analysts will claim that they are doing some modeling. <laughs> they can never predict. Right? The problem is, if I have such a tool, think of this, if I have such a tool, I can predict what the stock market is going to do tomorrow, that prediction itself will have a feedback. So I'm going to respond to that. Right? So as human beings, we want to maximize our profit. So that feedback mechanism where we are making decisions, human beings are making decisions with our brains, and our brain is not uh, a deterministic system. We cannot really model what is happening in there. So it's very difficult to develop a model, but still there are some simple models that will tell you the cause and effect, the input and output type of relationship. But again, another example is uh, a steam uh, heater which is what chemical engineers are primarily dealing with. And here we can develop a model. We can develop, uh, you can understand the dynamic response, and you can build uh, a control system. So here you have a stirred tank with a fluid coming at a certain flow rate and at a certain temperature. We will be using this example quite a lot. We will build actually a mathematical model and then look at the dynamic response. So here I have a steam heater, a coil, that is adding heat to that. And it's coming out at a different temperature. So the question is, if I open the steam valve by 10 percent, is the temperature T2 going to change instantly? The answer is no. It's going to take uh, a certain time. What, what is the reason for, for it to take a certain time? In the case of a car, we said it has certain inertia, mass time velocity, the momentum, certain inertia is associated with it. In heat transfer, what do we call it? Capacity, heat capacity. So if I write, for example, a heat balance equation for this, it will be MCP times dt dt, the rate of change of energy in that particular uh, tank is going to be equal to 
some of the external heat inputs and heat outputs. Okay, so in this case, the heat input is from the uh, team heater. The heat output is what is carried with it, and of course, another source of heat input is this. So this is going to go on the right hand side. Okay, so some energy comes in, some energy leaves, and I'm adding only energy. Some energy comes with the material. Some energy leaves with the material. And then I'm adding only energy through a heat exchange surface. Okay? All these three should go on the right hand side. So the reason for dynamics, once again, the DDP term is what is the dynamics about. Okay? It is the capacity. So here we call it the heat capacity. Mass times CP is the capacity of the reactor to hold heat. Okay? So it's not going to respond instantaneously. It's going to take a certain amount of time. Okay, so the answer to all these questions is that the response is not immediate and there is a delay okay, because of the dynamic response. So here is a sketch of what happens in the case of a team. If I open the valve by 10% at certain instant, I can open the valve almost instantly, maybe in microseconds. Okay? So there is still a dynamic associated with it, but that dynamics is much smaller compared to the response of the tank. And then initial value is T2. And if I get the same flow rate, what I will expect is the outlet temperature is to gradually increase over a period of time and reach a final value of T2 for the outlet temperature. Okay? So the outlet temperature goes from some initial value to some final value and the increase there is 12 degrees. That depends on uh, how much of steam I'm putting in. Okay? These are just still uh, examples. What we want to do is Okay, let me ask you this question. Um, as a process design engineer, what are the things that concern you most? Steady state operation, because we are operating the chemical plant most of the time under steady state condition. Okay? So as a design engineer, the first question that you would ask is, if I increase the steam flow rate by 10%, what would be my final outlet temperature? Because this may be taking 10 minutes or so, but then the plant is going to be operating at that temperature for whole day maybe. Okay? And you might find that this is the increase that you need to handle an increased flow rate or something that has changed in the plant. So as a design engineer, as a process engineer who wants to monitor the steady state uh, health of the plant, you are interested only in the steady state. The steady state is one where the temperature doesn't change with time. So if you go back to that equation, dt, this will be zero. So to solve for the steady state temperature, all you need to do is set the Rylan fan equal to zero and solve. And uh, what program does that for you? Fasting and Heises. They do exactly that. Mass balances and energy balances under steady state conditions. Okay? So if you change any input into the plant by a certain amount, it will tell you what the output will be under steady state conditions. But it doesn't tell you how long it takes to reach that steady state. And it doesn't tell you whether the steady state will remain steady in the presence of disturbances, which we don't know anything about. So, but there are disturbances, so that is why we need the control. Okay? So there are two aspects to control then. One is to control the steady state value if there are fluctuations here. These fluctuations are due to disturbances on the process. right? So you want to get rid of those disturbances, so the control action will be operating around this new steady state. The other point is, whenever you make a set change, you want to take the process from one steady state to the other steady state in the shortest possible time, for example. Okay? You don't want this, but you would prefer a graph that goes like this in a much shorter time. Okay? So in order to do that, you need to understand the dynamics. You need to write down the dynamical equations and study the performance of it by solving. This is where you get differential equations. When you're dealing with dynamical systems, you always have DDD term. So you're always dealing with ordinary differential equations. Any questions? So again, the question that uh, these, these notes, I guess, as I'm writing, I want this to be standalone. So when you read it on your own, you still fall over and try to kind of explain that. So I'm not really reading everything. That's not fine. You can read it by yourself, right? So uh, we do need steady state information. But in addition, 
uh, we need this initial information, as you will see later on, to get rid of the disturbances. We need to know where the steady state is so that we know when it moves from the steady state, it is due to a disturbance. So we can get rid of the disturbance. And when you're going from one steady state to another steady state, we need the transient behavior to be able to implement a better control uh, strategy. And uh, here is a, another example of uh, the thing that I claim to be, uh, we cannot model. This is somehow, if I can represent the standard of living by a certain measure, okay, and the standard of living without any government intervention of any form may drift and deteriorate like this because of poor economy, okay, because of competition coming from other countries, or whatever. So the government has to keep the economy active and going in the right direction. So there are two scenarios that we talked about. One is tax cuts, the other one is increased public spending. Okay. It would be nice if the politicians can completely trust a curve that we engineers or economists produce. But we cannot produce that in the first place. And so everybody is basically speculating. But these things do happen. Okay, so in the case, for example, if you increase the spending, here is a scenario where initially the standard of living might fall quite a bit, but it recovers very quickly back to the old values. Whereas if you do uh, tax cuts, they may have a different dynamic. They take longer because of this trickle-down theory that surplus money that we have, the rich have, have to spend and it has to trickle down all the way to the bottom, it may take a much longer time for the entire society to benefit from that kind of a stimulus. But still, the economy can be looked at in the same way as any process or any natural process or man-made process like a chemical plant. So that gives us the basis of what this course is about. Okay, we talked about several aspects of what control is and uh, what is the optimum way of getting the set points and uh, why do we need to look at dynamical models. Uh, the ingredients needed to reap the maximum benefit from an automatic process control would be we need sensors, we need final control elements, the actuators or the valves, we need to be concerned about safety issues, and we need to have a knowledge of the process itself. In the case of the economy, that is the most difficult to get, okay, because that involves human beings and interactions. But in the case of a chemical plant, we can get reasonably good models. Uh, Heisel, Aspen are good bases for us to build the models. There are uncertainties there that we will uh, discuss later on. And choosing the best operating point. We talked about the need for optimization there. And then control algorithms. <laughs> so this course is basically going to focus on control algorithms. How do we build, develop the process knowledge and build that control algorithm around the process knowledge? Uh, in terms of a dynamical system. Uh, I will let you read all those things, the same thing summarized in uh, words. Uh, here, an overview of a picture of what happens uh, for the whole plan, okay? So you formulate objectives at corporate level in terms of what you want your product uh, slate to be, how much of gasoline, how much of jet fuel, if it is a refinery, what do you think the demand is going to be for the next quarter, and you develop a large scale strategy. So that comes from management objectives, and it comes from what your plan can do currently. So based on that, you develop some sort of a large global objective. Okay? And that is fed into developing a process model. So this information goes into an entire process flow sheet that a process design engineer will have for a particular refinery. So he gives this information. The next three months, I want so much of gasoline, so much of diesel, so much of whatever it is. And you operate your plant to produce that. Okay? Then uh, this process engineer is going to use Aspen Heises, which basically uses computer simulation of the process model. Because you don't want to change right away. You want to see if I change the inputs, what are going to be the outputs. I want to make sure that I take this outputs, incorporate with the business model to see that I get the best profit out of it. Okay? Planned data is available. Sometimes planned data is used to build models where the model itself is very complicated. 
very often you will have the most central part of a chemical plant in a fluid clack catching unit, for example, a catalytic reactor, are very complex to model. You will have a simple uh, idealized model, but their performance differs quite a bit from the performance. So then you take plant data together with the model to build a more reliable model. Okay? And then we will de devise a control strategy to implement that objective that we have from the management. Okay? And that's what we are going to learn in this course. In this course, we are going to con look at process control theory together with computer simulation. So we will develop a strategy for design optimization and then control strategy and do a simulation on the computer okay? to, uh, to learn how to do these things. And then, of course, once we have that, select the hardware and software and uh, implement the control scheme uh, on the uh, install the software okay, selection where the vendor helps you in uh, selecting if you need to make any changes to the existing plant or if it is a new plant then you have to have a stronger participation from the vendor in procuring the equipment and the control system installation and then you will again play a role here in actually twiddling with the knobs or these days from the screen setting up the control objectives okay that information goes to the uh, control. So that gives you an overall picture of how the entire plant uh, is uh, optimized and controlled. And this course, I'm going to be focusing mostly on the control theory and the simulation. Okay. So now we are ready to begin to look at very concrete examples. Okay. So here is an uh, introductory example of a heater, a simple hot water heating system where I have certain flow rate, so many kilograms per hour, coming in and going out. Okay. Now I could later on put in variations in that. It is coming in at one rate and it is being sent to two different pipes, for example, at different rates. But right now I'm saying it is coming in at W, going at W. So what can you say about the level? Constant. But level controller is often a problem. When the flow rates are different, the level will change. So you will actually use the level controller to adjust the flow rate. But in this particular simple example, I just want to get a single ordinary differential equation. You will see when you allow the levels to change, then you need to look at the fluid mechanics, and you'll get an additional ordinary differential equation. So if you get rid of the fluid mechanics by saying the inlet and outlet flow rate are exactly maintained constant somehow, so the level is maintained constant. But if it's coming at a temperature of Ti, and the purpose of this process heater is to simply produce hot water for some downstream use. So that needs to be heated to a different temperature T. Okay? So it comes in at Ti, but it must leave at T. And how am I going to achieve that? I'm going to achieve that by putting a heater. Okay? So I'm going to actually control the heating element. This could be a steam heater, it could be an electrical heater, whatever it is, I need to be able to adjust the heat input from there by measuring this temperature and feeding back that information to the heater. Okay? So I'm going to first develop a dynamic model to understand how the system would respond and then build a control action on that. Now, I need to make certain assumptions. If I put a sensor, a thermocouple, on the exit to measure its temperature T. And then I take this back, that sensor, to adjust the heating. Do you think that's a good idea? Or if I put a thermocouple here and take that temperature and feed it back to it. Which one would you prefer? In the exit. If that is your target, that's what you want to do. So sensor location is very important. Okay? So in this particular case, you wouldn't want to do this. Okay? You want to take the sensor at the outlet and uh, use that because that's the temperature that you want. But in building a model, you need to say something about uh, the heat exchange process. I guess once I come to that, maybe you'll understand the problem better. So the design condition is such that W kilograms per second of the liquid is to be heated from Ti, the inlet temperature, to Tr with sufficient amount of energy Qf. So I made the description in, in plain English. Now I'm introducing symbols so that I can write a mathematical description of the particular uh, process. Okay. 
uh, this is a, this is what I was going to talk to you about. If I measure, we already know by the time that you answered that should I put the sensor here or I put a sensor there or there, you said I should put it in the pipe. So why did you say that? Because that would be a better representation of the temperature than other places. But I do have a mixer. I do have a stirrer in the tank. Okay. But even if I have a stirrer, the temperature is not going to be uniform everywhere because the mixing is not uniform. Okay. So that's where fluid mechanics comes in. And the same thing happens with reactors. When you have a reactor like this in a batch or a stir tank, have you done a reactor course? So you know what a CSTR is, continuous stir tank reactor. Okay. So you assume that the composition in such a tank is uniform everywhere. It is far from the truth, right? So that's why you do the residence time studies to see how much of a departure you have from that assumption. So in the same way, we are going to assume T is uniform in the tank while we know that it is not true. Okay, so because of improper mixing, the temperature from one point from the other point could be different. But by the time the liquid comes through this, there is sufficient mixing here that this temperature would be fairly uniform. There is, cannot be a much significant variation in the temperature across this, but it could be significantly different from the temperature there. Okay, in the interior. So we first develop the steady state model. So what is the steady state model? Simply say that energy coming in plus energy going out is uh, minus energy going out is equal to zero. Or you comfortable if I give you this and say this is the steady state balance, you're all okay with that or you want to explain. Okay? If, if you feel not okay, you just have to put up and put, I, I can explain, okay? But if you leave the lecture saying understand it, but then you really don't understand it, we have a problem. Okay? And this is where I need to strike a balance between those who are bored by explaining everything and those who are lost. <laughs> so I always try to make that balance. Okay? So certain things are important. This is a very basic thing that you have done a number of times in heat balance. So basically you will be saying rate of accumulation equals rate in minus rate of plus rate generation. Here we are saying steady state, there is no accumulation. Rate at which heat comes in is this W times C, the heat capacity times Ti, the inlet. That is the rate at which MCPT, MCP delta T, okay? That is the rate at which energy is coming in minus the rate at which energy is going out, WCTS, that is the exit temperature, okay? And heat is also coming in through QS, okay? So minus QS is equal to zero. Okay. Then I can write this as QS is equal to WC times, uh, I guess I have. Now, I need to assume something about QS, the sign of QS. If QS is positive, I am adding heat to the system. If QS is negative, I am taking heat out of the system. Okay. So this is a heater situation. So let us say that when I add, it is positive. So QS is positive. So in that case, this is going to be in. This is going to be out. That is to be a in. It's a positive number. So that should be a plus sign. Okay? And that will then give me QS equals WC times uh, TI minus TS. Not TS minus TI. Because QS remains on one side, and these two go to the other side, and that flips the sign. And that's what I have basically. So it simply gives you a heat balance. Are we out of time? Okay, so let me just uh, conclude with this. So under steady state condition, this is the heat balance equation. So you have one equation, but there are a number of symbols. That's where you get the degree of freedom. Now, this is a property, okay? But if you specify the inlet temperature, if you specify the heat rate, if you specify the mass flow rate, we can calculate what the outlet temperature will be. You have only one equation. So except for one variable, all the other variables should be specified. So in this case, all three should be specified, the heat rate, the flow rate, and the inlet temperature. But it could be any one of them. For example, I could give you the outlet temperature, I could give you the flow rate and the heat rate, and ask what is the inlet temperature. You should be able to solve for that from that equation. Okay? So we'll, in the next class, we will look at the dynamic version of this and put in controls on that and then illustrate in MATLAB how the system responds, okay? 
No, please do give me your feedback. Okay, if I'm going slow, you have to tell me. Then I can speed it up. Okay, but if I'm going fast, you also have to tell me. You have to slow down. All right. So see you next week. <laughs>